welcome to the 13th annual Kosciuszko Chair Spring Symposium. This year's virtual conference will focus on the topic of crisis in the intermarium, war in Ukraine and its implications. And today's joint virtual symposium is organized by the Institute of World Politics and is in honor of Lady Blanca Rosenstiel. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We offer a doctoral program, seven master's degree programs, including two online MAs, and 18 certificates of graduate study. If you are interested in learning more about us, please visit iwp.edu. On behalf of IWP, I'd like to thank all our supporters who make these events possible. Today, we'll hear from Dr. Gabor Chismazia, who will give a lecture entitled, A New Take on New Europe. Opportunities and Pitfalls for American Conservative Statecraft in East Central Europe. Dr. Gismatia is a research fellow at the John Luchatsk Institute for Strategy and Politics at the Ludovica University of Public Service, focusing on U.S. foreign policy and the security relationship with East Central Europe. He was a visiting researcher at George Washington University and a scholarship recipient of the George C. Marshall's European Center for Security Studies. Currently, he teaches U.S. government and foreign policy and geopolitics in East Central Europe for future Hungarian defense officials and diplomats. The presentation was prepared by the speaker with the support of the Hungarian Jodvios State Scholarship. Please welcome Dr. Cizmatia. So. Welcome. Uh, in the next half hour, I'm going to talk about uh, East Central Europe, the region of East Central Europe and its uh, place in uh, contemporary American conservative foreign policy thinking. My name is Gabor Cizmazia. I am a research fellow at the John Lukács Institute for Strategy and Politics at the Ludovica University of Public Service in Budapest, Hungary. Uh, I currently do independent research uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, on uh, cons uh, contemporary American foreign policy thinking and East Central Europe, many of the political and the security uh, aspects of this relationship. And this independent research and this presentation as well was supported by the Hungarian Ötvös State Scholarship. So in the next half hour or so, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a, brief, a brief introduction on why this research is uh, relevant or why this topic is uh, relevant and uh, what is the background dilemma uh, in this regard, particularly to conservative foreign policy thinking here in the US and how East Central Europe steps in into this uh, thinking. Uh, I basically outlined the uh, issue that uh, obviously the uh, conservative uh, uh, realm uh, in foreign policy thinking in the US is very divided right now and the historical fusion of the uh, 20th century after the end of the Cold War and uh, particularly uh, after the early 2000s uh, evaporated or disappeared and hasn't really manifested since then even though we are in the era of great, uh, renewed great power competition and geopolitic, geopolitical competition. Uh, I would argue that there is uh, uh, a line of thinking in East Central, on East Central Europe among American conservatives that uh, can complement each other. They might not be able to uh, make a fusion, uh, but they definitely complement each other. And if uh, slightly amended, slightly uh, taken into consideration the uh, foreign policy, the security policy challenges uh, in the region, then it can uh, uh, forge a, a new fusion or at least a more co uh, cohesive foreign policy thinking with regards to East Central Europe. So in the introduction, I'm going to talk about this, uh, the background of uh, this issue, followed by the uh, political and security challenges in East Central Europe. So basically to highlight uh, properly what are what is the political and security environment in the region that uh, American foreign policy thinkers and especially conservatives who have their specific, uh, specific views uh, on the region should uh, consider. And lastly, I'm going to give a few recommendations on what are the uh, issues or questions that should be uh, taken into consideration or in focus when uh, applying the uh, first point uh, and first point mentioned uh, uh, conservative foreign policy thoughts on East Central Europe. So a brief introduction on the region itself and on Europe itself. 
regardless whether we're talking about conservative foreign policy thinking or just in general American foreign policy, uh, the uh, overall strategic aim or goal of the uh, United States is to have a Europe whole, free, and one that is at peace. Uh, this is basically a, con a consensus, although the emphases, emphases lie uh, on different aspects of these uh, three uh, on these uh, three pillars. From a cons uh, conservative perspective, in the last few years, there are three things that came up uh, that are important priorities with regards to the transatlantic relationship. Firstly, that uh, a trans transatlantic ally should be able to deter Russian threat. Secondly, they should be able to address somehow the Chinese influence in Europe, particularly in East Central Europe. And last but not least, whatever the relationship is on the, uh, between the partners and the allies on the two sides of the Atlantic, they should uh, provide uh, and be a partner in security, at least on the European side. In other words, they shouldn't be consumers of security, but actually providers of security. This is an old debate that's going on in the transatlantic relationship, uh, but uh, one that has been emphasized particularly among American conservatives in the last few years. So what is their dilemma? Uh, the conservative dilemma is an interesting one because on the one hand, it was American conservatives who introduced the term geopolitics and great power competition into uh, publicly available official security, national security documents in 2017. I'm thinking particularly about the uh, uh, Trump administration's uh, 2017 national security strategy, which openly used the terms geopolitics and great power competition, which were not really part of official documents uh, up until that point. Obviously, scholars and researchers talked about it for several decades at, uh, at that point. However, it was, it was conservatives, conservatives, uh, conservatives who uh, introduced uh, these, uh, these concepts in official documents. And basically, there is wide consensus right now that we are living in the era of a renewed geopolitical and great power competition. On the other hand, uh, the GOP and generally conservatives are divided up until this day, uh, particularly on Ukraine, interestingly, and more generally on internationalism. Now, the conservative camp can be uh, divided into various uh, uh, factions and various groups. Uh, here, I just uh, show a simplified chart or a line that, uh, in my opinion, uh, separates the conservatives to two basic uh, endpoints. Uh, on the one hand, you have non-interventionists, some call them isolationists or neo-isolationists. And on the other hand, you have foreign policy hawks. Hawkishness is a general uh, characteristics of uh, Republican foreign policy thinking. However, whether they, this hawkish attitude is actually applied in a proactive way, in an internationalist way, that's not necessarily shared among conservatives. So that's why I put these two ends on the scale. And if you look at the, the, the scale, you see that there are various groups. I just mentioned uh, uh, four of them. Obviously, there are more labels that can be applied. Some people talk about realists and the nationalists or national conservatives, conservative internationalists, and even the uh, uh, neoconservative uh, label is uh, used uh, these days, even though their influence is, uh, is uh, debatable, at least uh, when it comes to, uh, uh, to academia. Uh, there are many other labels. The, the emphasis is not particularly on the labels themselves. So I'm not going to focus on these particular camps because these are abstract outlines of uh, conservative foreign policy thinking. And you can use many other labels as well, including in domestic politics. Uh, some people talk about the establishment uh, Republicans, the old guard, others talk about the so-called new right. On the other hand, whether they are populists or they are just anti-elites. So there are many other factions that we can talk about. Instead of the labels, I would like to highlight the fault lines, particularly what and how should be conserved in the United States and in generally in the West. And in this regard, there are two issues or two main topics that align to uh, this uh, division. On the one hand, uh, on the, uh, the right end of the scale, uh, we can talk about the emphasis on international security and free markets and free trade. And on the other hand, if you bend this, uh, this line, uh, you can talk about the emphasis on uh, national sovereignty and cultural issues, and basically uh, employ, uh, the uh, emphasis on 
the domestic challenges, particularly with regards to the economy and uh, employment. Again, this is a simplified view of the conservative foreign policy thinking, but I believe that these are the main fault lines uh, that separate uh, the aforementioned various groups with regards to specific foreign policy issues, for example, the uh, with regards to the uh, support to Ukraine or the presence in Europe uh, in general. Uh, however, even though we're still talking about two ends of the uh, scales, these various groups, uh, regardless of what label we're going to uh, use for them, on these issues, so international security, national sovereignty, and cultural aspects of, uh, of security, employment, and free trade, uh, they, uh, in one way or another, actually contribute uh, complementary elements to a uh, uh, new take on new Europe, on East Central Europe. Again, starting with the, on the right, on international security, uh, you basically can find uh, internationalists, Republican internationalists, who openly talk about a strategic reorientation for a couple of years now with regards to East Central Europe. Uh, for example, uh, House Representative uh, Mike Rogers or House Representative Mike Turner, two of the co-authors uh, of the uh, uh, plan for victory in Ukraine, the Republican plan for victory in Ukraine from last year, which is basically the uh, foundation for the recently approved $61 billion aid package to uh, Ukraine. So an internationalist, Republican internationalist view, they openly talked about and actually wrote about opinion pieces in the last couple of years that the United States should uh, reorient strategically in Europe from Western Europe to East Central Europe. And technically this means if you take a look at the, uh, uh, the, the uh, center uh, uh, bottom, bottom center of uh, the slide, this means the permanent basing. So uh, these officials uh, and firm, uh, former Trump administration officials, for example, A. West Mitchell, also internationalist, talk about uh, the uh, uh, relevance of establishing new permanent military establishments or bases in East Central Europe, particularly in those countries uh, that are most aligned with regards to geopolitics and uh, military security to American foreign policy interests. Uh, particularly the uh, Baltic states, uh, Poland and uh, uh, Romania. Uh, you can argue that these issues have been raised already by the end of the Trump administration. For example, you might recall that in uh, the last year uh, of, the, uh, of the administration in 2020, uh, uh, President Trump announced that he's going to withdraw about 9,000 uh, U.S. soldiers from Germany out of the th roughly 35,000 that were uh, stationed there. Uh, and uh, there were rumors, although it hasn't been officially uh, uh, confirmed, but there were rumors and uh, discussions uh, that some of those troops would be uh, based uh, in Poland and not, not all of them just withdrawn uh, from, from overseas into the United States. So on the one hand, internationalists argue for a strategic reorientation. Now, if you take a look at the left side of the, uh, uh, of the, of the graph, uh, the uh, uh, conservatives who emphasize national sovereignty and the cultural aspects also emphasize a kind of reorientation, though not strategically, but based on political affinity. Uh, so other uh, countries, as, uh, other uh, uh, political actors as well, uh, uh, set into spotlight of uh, stronger cooperation, stronger ties with, uh, between the United States and East Central European countries. Uh, particularly with the idea of looking at the West not just as a, a series of international uh, organizations, institutions, and arrangements, but also as a civilization. Again, hinting, for example, hinting uh, at the uh, or pointing at uh, the uh, Trump administration's uh, uh, legacy in, in the region. Uh, for example, the uh, major uh, speech by President Trump in Europe in the summer of uh, 2017 was actually about the preservation of Western civilization. Now, that was a divisive uh, speech in the sense that it received a lot of criticism in uh, Western Europe and uh, um, uh, in liberal and progressive groups. But in East Central Europe, and uh, you'll see that on the presentation, there is actually a basis uh, for that. And there was basis for that in, in Poland. Uh, so there was a, a, a receptive uh, audience uh, for that. And in between where the line bends uh, on uh, on the uh, on the uh, scale, you see a so-called market niche filling group uh, of conservatives. 
who basically include both internationalists and you know, isolationists or people who uh, support international security or emphasize international security and also emphasize uh, national sovereignty and uh, culture as well. Uh, basically, their focus is on energy export and reindustrialization. This means technically two things. Uh, re energy export means uh, the uh, emphasis on uh, uh, U.S. LNG exports to Europe and to East Central Europe as well. Uh, House and uh, Senate Republicans uh, basically emphasized in the last few months uh, for the Biden administration to uh, halt certain limits on fracking and on licensing of U.S. LNG exports, particularly in order to support uh, East Central European countries to uh, uh, get rid of Russian dependence or further decrease Russian dependence in energy and of course also to support American jobs in that particular sector. Reindustrialization is also related uh, to uh, uh, the defense industry. Obviously uh, in the, the last uh, couple of years and particularly since the uh, uh, Russian uh, invasion against Ukraine, uh, employment in the uh, defense sector uh, is also uh, an important factor with regards to uh, how the United States can support these uh, countries. Uh, so uh, this central line of thinking or this market niche filling is actually supported by both uh, ends of uh, the uh, conservative uh, scale. This does not mean a fusion, but it does point uh, to the fact that uh, we are emphasizing three uh, separate lines of, uh, uh, of ideas uh, that actually complement each other with regards to transatlantic relations in, uh, between the United States and East Central Europe. So in order to weigh that or see that more clearly, we should look at the political and security environment uh, of East Central Europe. We could start with Atlan the issue of Atlanticism. So how receptive these countries are to uh, strong American ties. Uh, the Globsec Trends uh, publication has done uh, surveys in these countries, in the population of these countries in the last few years. And the last three years, 2021 to 2023, uh, shows uh, that uh, most of these countries actually regard the United States as a strategic partner. Uh, and there are some uh, exceptions for whom uh, the U.S. is not a primary strategic partner, for example, Czechia, Hungary or Slovakia. In this case, Germany has been identified as a strategic partner, but those uh, uh, reflect alternative uh, motives. For example, they, are, they regard Germany as a uh, uh, security partner, uh, per, uh, probably because of uh, the uh, emphasis on the economic ties and trade ties instead of the security ties. But obviously, if you take a look at the Baltic states or Poland or Romania, where security issues are, military security issues are regarded uh, more important uh, or more relevant uh, in the last few years uh, than other countries, the United States is the primary uh, strategic partner. But even if we look at the countries for whom the U.S. is not the primary strategic partner, we'll see at the lower end of the, of the slide, we'll see that even there, there is an increasing tendency for the U.S. to be regarded as a strategic uh, uh, partner. So even there, the U.S. position is uh, getting stronger, again, with a few uh, exceptions, for example, with Bulgaria and Slovakia. But overall, uh, with regards to Atlanticism, there is uh, an opening uh, here in East Central Europe to uh, transatlantic cooperation. The similar can be said about uh, defense spending. Uh, on the slide you see uh, the official uh, most available uh, uh, source on the member states, NATO member states defense, uh, defense spending estimates for the last year. Uh, basically, currently, according to uh, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, uh, 18 out of the uh, uh, 32 NATO members uh, most likely going to reach 2% uh, uh, of GDP uh, on defense expenditure. Now, most East Central European countries already fall uh, in that category. And uh, some of these East Central European countries actually have an advantage with regards to the other important metric of meeting the 20% target for equipment expenditure and uh, capability uh, development as well. Uh, so there is definitely 
uh, an advantage here in the region if we focus on uh, defense spending, which is also an important aspect for American conservatives when they view their relationship with uh, Europe. Another aspect in this regard is how much they support Ukraine. On the slide, you see uh, uh, data based on the Kiel Institute. Uh, th uh, this data shows a uh, support uh, for Ukraine in terms of humanitarian, financial and uh, military efforts or military equipment, military support uh, in percentage of national GDP. Now, in this regard, I highlighted the lo lower end France, Germany and United States who seemingly provide, uh, based on this chart, uh, uh, lower levels of support. But again, this is the percentage of GDP. They actually provide, obviously, much larger amount of the support. Most of the military support comes from the United States. However, if you take a look at how big of a burden it is for various countries, then uh, Unshockingly, the East Central European countries and particularly the Baltic states and Poland stand out with regards to how much they spend on uh, uh, on Ukraine and how much uh, they spend in percentage of uh, GDP. And the sources, from, as I mentioned, from the Kiel Institute, this was actually applied by the aforementioned authors of the uh, plan for victory uh, on, in Ukraine, uh, the aforementioned Republican uh, authors, uh, with the uh, essence of or with the goal of pointing out uh, that uh, Europe is actually playing its weight, but uh, disproportionately uh, among uh, among member states uh, of NATO in Europe, just like in the case of the spe uh, defense expenditure. The other major aspect, uh, in addition to uh, the Russian threat, is obviously Chinese influence in the terms of Chinese investment projects through the Bath and Road Initiative or just through bilateral cooperations. Now, in this regard, East Central European countries should be in the spotlight because of the Belt and Road Initiative cooperation. However, again, in uh, put into perspective, uh, basically we see that uh, the uh, picture is quite mixed because uh, even though East Central European countries in the last few years, as you see on the uh, left, uh, on the uh, chart on the left, the last few years, last two or three years, received uh, considerable support or considerable investments uh, from uh, from China, particularly Hungary. However, again, if we make, uh, take a step back and look at the last 10 years, we see that other countries like Germany, Finland and Sweden actually uh, received a uh, lot more, much more uh, Chinese uh, investments. And if you take a look at the right, uh, you, uh, end of the, uh, uh, of the slide, uh, again, based uh, on uh, uh, on the same, on the same, same metrics, you see that countries in the three, uh, three C's initiative, so basically East Central European countries, again received a smaller amount of investments in the last 10 years compared to uh, Germany, France or uh, Sweden. The uh, relevance in this regard is not so much of how much uh, investment uh, they received, how many million dollars, uh, but rather on uh, the areas. Uh, or sectors those investments were based, particularly on transport sector, transportation, technology and energy in this order. Uh, now, these uh, investments point to uh, the, uh, the fact that East Central Europe is, even though we talk about it a lot with regards to Chinese influence uh, or Chinese uh, target, uh, being a Chinese target for, for investments, uh, they're basically not the primary uh, targets of Chinese investment. Germany has uh, received lot, uh, much more investments from uh, the People's Republic of China in this regards uh, is strategically probably more important uh, for uh, the country. Uh, but what both regions point at, so both Western Europe, Germany, France, Sweden and uh, East Central Europe, is that there is a European effort for reindustrialization. So as I, uh, as, you, uh, as I mentioned, most of this support, most of this investment goes uh, into the transport sector, uh, probably the auto, uh, um, pro uh, particularly the auto industry, uh, which is part of uh, all of these East Central European countries and uh, Germany's efforts of uh, uh, in, uh, turning to uh, a green transition and particularly to uh, reindustrialize uh, the economy after years of, uh, of outsourcing. Uh, these data, by the way, uh, are supported by again conservative sources from the AEI China Global Investment Tracker, uh, which is uh, published by the American Enterprise Institute in cooperation with the Heritage Foundation. Uh, now, another important aspect here is uh, the energy uh, 
uh, export to the region and to Europe. In this regard, the United States again has a good position. So the conservative idea behind emphasizing energy exports and reindustrialization by primarily energy exports in, into uh, the region is well based. In uh, the last uh, decade or so, especially in the last couple of years, the United States actually was one of the main exporters uh, or source of, uh, of import of LNG uh, in Europe, in addition to Qatar, Russia, uh, and Algeria and other sources. Of course, uh, this is obviously still in flux, uh, uh, depending on the uh, on the idea whether the United States actually like to focus on energy exports as an important element of foreign policy uh, uh, efforts or American statecraft. Uh, but East Central Europe uh, within Europe is actually one of the main uh, target areas or potential target areas of American export. In this regard, the, uh, the question is basically the infrastructure, just like before. Now, the Three Seas Initiative Fund uh, actually supports this, uh, uh, th these efforts. Uh, particularly under the Trump administration, there was a promise made by Washington uh, DC that uh, the United States is going to provide $300 million to uh, the Three Seas Initiative Fund, which amount of money, as far as I know, did uh, receive, or at least the United States actually backed it up, although uh, several years later, and if I recall, uh, shortly after the invasion in uh, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. So there, in among conservatives, there's definitely more appetite uh, for uh, energy cooperation with the purpose of uh, exporting American LNG uh, to uh, the region. And uh, lastly, one uh, important aspect, uh, as I mentioned, conservatives and Americans like to focus also on the idea that Europe should be free as well. So we have to look at uh, East Central European views on democracy and institutions. Now, starting with the institutions, we see that East Central European countries, again, based on the Globesec Trends surveys, actually support both NATO and EU membership uh, very highly. So there's a strong support in both, uh, both regards, particularly for NATO membership, uh, but also for EU membership. The latter varies, uh, but overall, in both cases, it is firm support in the last, it enjoys firm support, overwhelming support in all East Central European countries in the last uh, three uh, or more uh, years or so. What's interesting here is not so much the institutional aspect, but rather what they believe, uh, what they think on uh, democracy. So what these countries, what these nations think about democracy. If you take a look at the uh, the chart on the top right corner, uh, you see uh, uh, again based on the GlobeSec trends from the last three years, uh, how these East Central European countries uh, associate equality, human rights freedoms and the rule of law with democracy or liberal democracy. According to the surveys, uh, both democracy and liberal democracy enjoys uh, wide support among these countries. The interesting, here, uh, the interesting thing here is that there is a distinction between democracy and liberal democracy. And the cause of that is that the term liberal has uh, mixed uh, meanings. You can, you can see that more closely in the uh, 2022 survey of Globsec Trends, which is on the uh, left uh, bottom uh, corner of the slide, that emphasizes the uh, issue of whether uh, identity and values uh, are viewed as being threatened by certain uh, processes or certain factors in East Central Europe. And by certain factors, I mean either the Western way of living or liberal democracy. And basically, you see here that, uh, again, these two things are uh, separated or at least are distinguished. And the Western way of living for uh, some people in these countries, considerable number of people, uh, threatens their national identity and traditional values. But it's not really the West that's the target of their critiques, but rather uh, liberalism. Now, this is not an academic uh, uh, understanding of liberalism per se. It just shows that liberalism or liberal uh, pol uh, politics, uh, I would e rather use the word progressive, actually has negative connotations, partly because uh, these societies historically are more conservative than other parts of Europe, uh, and partly obviously because it receives criticism from the uh, political right uh, in these uh, countries. So, 
based on that, what are the recommendations or what are the uh, added notes with regards to conservative foreign policy thinking and East Central Europe? Again, going back to the previous slide of how these uh, two main groups uh, uh, of conservatives who emphasize international security or national sovereignty and culture actually uh, uh, complement uh, with their uh, uh, provide complementary uh, views or ideas to uh, East Central European security, starting with, inter uh, with uh, conservatives who focus international security and strategic reorientation. Uh, we can basically see on the surveys and on uh, and the security, political and security environment that uh, there is definitely a opportunity for strategic reorientation for the United States in East Central Europe, uh, based on how much they spend on the defense uh, in terms of percentage of GDP or how much support they provide to uh, Russia and how enthusiastic there are uh, uh, some countries to receive uh, permanent U.S. military installations, primarily thinking at the, uh, the Baltic states and Poland. However, it should be noted that a special relationship that occurred in the early 2000s, so kind of old Europe, new Europe divide, uh, is not a simple redux or not something that can be just done the same way as it was done in the early 2000s, because most of these countries, in fact, all of these countries uh, have overwhelming support for the Western institutions, uh, including NATO. So uh, US conservatives should consider that uh, even if they want to reorient strategically, uh, from the west uh, to the eastern side uh, of, of NATO, as they say that the uh, the gravity of NATO actually shifts uh, eastward. They should also consider uh, to uh, not uh, divide the European uh, community or European allies as it happened in the early 2000s. The other thing that they should consider in this regard uh, is also uh, uh, connected here is that uh, Western European resources still matter. And by resources, I mean political clout and financial uh, weight or financial uh, resources. Uh, for example, in the defense industry, uh, there is obviously an emphasis in all European countries or most European countries to reindustrialize uh, and uh, re refocus the, the national resources on arms production. And East Central Europe actually in many, uh, many aspects uh, focuses on this issue a lot more than, than Western European countries. However, the uh, European defense sector is uh, well slightly fragmented, say the least, uh, and any uh, Emphasis on or emphasis on East Central Europe should also, uh, or, or emphasis on East Central Europe should also consider that uh, the uh, large uh, consortia and the large uh, 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 spotlights or or hubs uh, overall in European defense industry, uh, basically in terms of capital or in terms of technology, is still in Western Europe. So they also also consider that when uh, conservatives think on reorienting strategically uh, to the east. Looking at the center of the market niche filling, again, energy security, as I mentioned, is very important for uh, East Central Europe. So there is definitely an open market there uh, to receive American LNG. Uh, however, what should be considered, and this is not a counter argument, this is just something that they should, the conservatives should also consider, uh, is that in the long run, it's not just about Russia. So the uh, Chinese investments show, especially, especially in the auto industry, uh, that there's a huge emphasis on reindustrializing uh, these uh, these countries, particularly in manufacturing of uh, of, uh, of cars uh, and of uh, of uh, batteries uh, and other uh, technological products. All of this requires vast amounts of energy. Now, it's really hard to uh, determine of how much energy uh, this actually requires, electricity and gas. But the point is, the uh, United States should uh, uh, emphasize, emphasize on investing in the three stage initiative, going back on the energy track, as conservatives have done in, in the uh, last years, not just because uh, it should support a uh, uh, decreasing, further decreasing on uh, dependence on Russian gas, but also because this, these areas are going to need 
uh, the the energy for for the reindustrialization uh, efforts. And if the United States is not going to step in, then these sources will be brought in uh, from elsewhere. Uh, mainly probably uh, through Germany. Uh, Germany is an important aspect in this regard, but not an East, not an East Central European country, but uh, its attitude with regards to uh, 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 the overview of Chinese investments and the energy import that they're going to fuel uh, their reindustrialization and their their economy uh, is, is crucial for East Central European countries as well because of the close trade relations and because uh, of some of the German companies are actually located in the region. In this regard, again, the Three Seas uh, Initiative Fund should be re-emphasized in, in uh, conservative foreign policy thinking uh, and a more closer cooperation with regards to infrastructure development. Uh, North-South uh, infrastructure development should be set in the uh, spotlight uh, much more than than uh, previously. And lastly, if we take a look at the conservatives who emphasize sovereignty and uh, national sovereignty and cultural issues, uh, their idea of political affinity based cooperation with East Central European countries uh, is actually again well based, uh, based on the uh, uh, surveys of how East Central European countries and societies uh, view uh, the West and in general uh, progressive politics and liberalism. Uh, now, what's very important here is that uh, any kind of uh, of uh, stepping in or or cooperation on these lines uh, should offer an alternative to, to geopolitical foes? What do I mean by that? By this, I mean that uh, it's not just about going against Vogue pol uh, politics or, or Vogue ideas. It's also about countering other anti-Western external issues. So for example, uh, the uh, some readings of the Eurasianism, which also basically uh, assaults or or uh, states that uh, Western uh, culture or Western uh, consumption and Western liberalism is actually uh, a uh, threat to national identities and traditional values. Now, these uh, ideas are going to pop, going to, uh, to continuously pop up uh, from from the outside, from these uh, uh, Eurasian school of thought. But the point is. Uh, Western uh, democracies and East Central European countries and conservatives in general should be able to provide an alternative or an answer to that of why that's not the case, of why, uh, yes, liberalism is an internal part of, uh, of Western culture. However, there, the Western culture also supports these uh, some of these traditional uh, values. And uh, it's important to uh, provide an alternative for, for these uh, uh, outside the threats, because otherwise uh, the uh, soft power of the West is uh, probably going to vain uh, in light of the uh, economic and uh, other challenges. So you can't just put all your eggs in one basket on institutions and economy and prosperity, because even though that's important in East Central Europe, cultural wars do matter. So that's also an important aspect. But it has to be have to uh, uh, provide uh, a viable alternative to outside geopolitical foes uh, or adversaries. Again, historically, if, if you, uh, we think back of the historical fusion of the conservatives, uh, what the fusion was made possible because of the common enemy being communist, the communist Soviet, Soviet Union, actually provided the line of thinking or, or a role for uh, traditionalists or neo-traditionalists later on. And the final point in this regard is uh, whatever, as I mentioned, cultural walls matter, but uh, whatever alternative uh, uh, these conservatives uh, offer or, or establish, it should be uh, operationalized. So uh, some of the main, or the main uh, challenge for uh, these conservatives I would say historically, so in the last few decades, has been that their ideas are quote unquote more philosophical. So it's less operationalizable than, for example, the aforementioned strategic reorientation or finding a market niche in energy exports and reindustrialization and, and uh, trade. But rather, ideas that the government uh, governments might uh, uh, not be able to provide to the uh, uh, public if not backed up by uh, the appropriate soft power uh, capabilities. So if they have, so in other words, conservatives should not uh, based on their uh, hopes just on the political affinity. They also have to have an operationalization plan of how 
the uh, alternative for the external cultural threats against the West should be countered uh, with, within house, so to say, and uh, how these ideas should be supported across East Central Europe and uh, across uh, the West. That in mind, uh, I, uh, I believe that the conservative foreign policy thinking, even though it's very divided uh, in the, uh, the last years, and we definitely cannot talk about a fusion uh, at the moment, although there is a debate whether Reaganism and Trumpism can be uh, uh, fused uh, together, uh, as some expert uh, highlight. I believe that this uh, issue is going to be a topic for debate regardless uh, of the outcome of the uh, upcoming presidential elections. And I believe that East Central Europe is an area where uh, either a fusion or a complementary cooperation between these lines of thinking can provide a fertile ground, as highlighted in the presentations. Uh, and with that, uh, I thank you for your uh, attention and uh, look, looking forward to your thoughts, feedback or questions uh, on the contacts uh, below. Thank you once again. All the best.